We, we have been on a long flight, and the landing gear is starting to come down, okay? If you're tracking with us on Psalm 119, we are nearing the end. There, after today, there's only two more weeks. So you're starting to get that announcement to, you know, put your trays in the, back in position, and we're going to land this psalm, uh, and uh, you'll never forget it again. At least I hope so. When you're going through your Bible, and any time Psalm 119 is mentioned, uh, hopefully you'll remember something useful, not just some weird thing that I said about some cartoon character or something. All right, here we go. I'll read the whole portion. We're in Psalm 119, uh, verse 154. I won't show it to you yet because I'm going to break it up piece by piece. But here's what it says. Look on my suffering and deliver me, for I have not forgotten your law. Defend my cause and redeem me. Preserve my life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek out your decrees. Your compassion, Lord, is great. Preserve my life according to your laws. Many are the foes who persecute me, but I have not turned from your statutes. I look on the faithless with loathing, for they do not obey your word. See how I love your precepts. Preserve my life, Lord, in accordance with your love. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. So let me recap a couple of quick things as we, as we wrap up this psalm in a couple of weeks. But all of these words you'll, you've heard for weeks and weeks, if you've listened or heard or been here, law, statute, precept, decree, command, ordinances, word, promise, they're all pretty much interchangeable with little differences, little nuances in terms of what they mean, but that's what the psalmist is getting at. So when you keep hearing those words, they're not necessarily completely different. I'm going to read one paragraph that I read very, very early on. can't believe to say 20 weeks ago that I read this paragraph, so most of you will not remember it. Uh, Psalm 119 has 22 carefully constructed sections, each corresponding to a different letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and each verse beginning with the letter of its section. Almost every verse mentions God's word. Such repetition was common in the Hebrew culture. People did not have personal copies of the scriptures as we do. So God's people memorized his word and passed it on along orally. The structure of the psalm allowed for easy, <laughs> that's funny, it says easy memorization. Can you imagine remembering over 160 verses and just be like, yeah, got it, okay? Woo, you know, like we can't even remember people's phone numbers anymore. Like if it's not in our phone, hello, anybody? Like, you, some of you don't even know your own phone number. You're like, I've never called myself. I don't know. And like, once it's in there, it's, it's lost. And so every time when I show you this Hebrew letter at the beginning of the section of Psalm 119, realize like that would, like someone could literally say, I, I guess it's resh. And someone would go, all right, look at my suffering and deliver. I mean, like, what? Like, can you imagine that? And how much would we scramble if tomorrow all the Bibles were gone, all the apps were deleted off our phone, and we had to suddenly say, what do you remember? What do you remember? Maybe we can piece together an entire Bible, right? That's scary. But that was part of this culture, that they would memorize. So let's jump into this first section. Look at my suffering and deliver me, for I have not forgotten your law. Defend my cause and redeem me. Preserve my life according to your promise. Well, the first thing I want you to see that God does see us, and oftentimes he acts upon what he, our response to him. But it's not a secret formula. <laughs> Remember, Old Testament believers would understand. They'd be familiar with God's word because they were memorizing it. They'd be under, they would remember God's promises. They wouldn't say, what, is the, what does God say? And they would also remember his attributes, how the Bible describes God. Here's an example of it. Psalm 18 says this. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. Right? Those are strong, powerful words describing who God is and what he does. It goes on to say, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. Amen? And, then, and this is what it should draw up when we say, I'm calling on God. Well, who's God? I don't know. Some, someone in the sky that I think pays attention. Like, no, no. These are the descriptive words that they would remember, that they would recall and say, no, no, this is who God is. He's my shield, my stronghold. He's strong. He's a deliverer. He brings me 
salvation. And there's these words that they used in, the, in Psalm 119, deliver or rescue and redeem, right? Deliver, we've heard some of this before, but to deliver is to draw off or out, right? You're being delivered. You're taken out of the situation, right? When, you, when you're getting rescued, if you, were, if you were struggling swimming, you don't just say, yeah, throw me a lifeline and then you can leave. Like, I just need something to float on. I'm good. I'm just going to hold that. No, deliver and rescue means you take me out. I don't want to be in this situation anymore. And then the idea of redeem is a whole bunch of words. Avenger, deliver, next kinsfolk, and purchase. Now, that word doesn't necessarily roll off the tongue. We don't, I don't know many people that say that phrase, but it, it refers to something. How many people have read the book of Ruth ever? Are you familiar with it? Right? And there's this picture between Ruth and Boaz in the, in the book of Ruth, it uses the word kinsman redeemer. And what it means is to be the next of kin. But you're not just the next of kin. You have a, a, a job to do as you are the next of kin. Such as, here's a couple examples, you would buy back a relative's property. You would marry somebody's widow because you would be protecting them. And, and Ruth calls Boaz that. You're our kinsman redeemer. And so there's that picture of God being the Redeemer, that he is literally rescuing us and he's buying us back. Amen? And he purchased us by going to the cross, right? He paid that price so we could be returned, we could be redeemed. And so there's that, that picture again. And then that word preserve, you're going to hear it a bunch of times today in Psalm 119. We've talked about it. I almost should quiz you. It's three words and they all start with R. Here we go. Recover, repair, and restore. So every time the Bible says, preserve my life, right? Like, it's not like, put, a, put me in a jar, put, put some sugar in there, and close me up, and I will taste good in a couple of months, okay? Right? No one thinks of that? Come on, preserve. We're like, oh, okay, nobody can touch me. No, it actually means recover, repair, and restore. And when the psalmist says this, he's not just saying, God, preserve my life. I think you can do it. He knows who this God is, and he knows he can do it. And we need the reminder sometimes, right? Wednesday night, there was a breakout worship session that began with Laura and Claire. I won't put them on the spot now. All right? It's a song we sing. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That is who you are. Why do we sing a song like that? Because we need to remind her who God is. Because in our situation, sometimes we can forget that those words are, are biblical words that describe who God is. And in those moments, we can forget. And so we need reminders sometimes. Psalm 119 goes on to say this, Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek out your decrees. All right, what's the first thing you think of wicked? There she is. Come on, some of you are already there. All right. That's automatically what we think of, all right? He's stating the obvious, all right? He's not calling people names. So the, the word wicked means that somebody is guilty or morally wrong. So do you know? We're all wicked. How come I'm the only one raising my hand? <laughs> the reality is we're all guilty and we've all done something morally wrong. Come on. Come on. Air out this armpit with me, okay? I'll let you do the other one later, all right? Like, like that's, that's the reality of life. And until we admit that, sometimes I'm like, no, we're not. No, I, I'm not like her, okay? Right? Like, this is not about the wicked witch. This is like, this word is, is, is synonymous with humans. We're wicked. And he's saying that not to call them names, all right? These are people who are like, not following Jesus' ways, they're not following his words, and we would say in Christianese that they are not saved. We're going to see they're, they're, that's not an unbiblical word, it's not an unbiblical picture, but that's what we would just say. But the reality was, before we were saved, we were wicked. We were in the same spot. And so he's just stating the obvious. He's saying, salvation is far from those who aren't following Jesus, for they don't seek out your decrees. That's not odd, right? Like, that, like somebody who is, who is not running every day is not ready for a marathon. You don't say they're a marathon runner. Come on, let, let's, let's be really honest for a minute. You've seen somebody running on the street and you go, they just started. Come on, 
like they might have all the gear, but they're like they don't have a good stride yet. They're you know I don't you know you're not making fun. You're just like yeah. And then again, you're like that would be me too. <laughs> like I am not ready for this. That that doesn't describe me. So him saying wicked, he's not he's not making fun of them. He's stating the obvious. What's so interesting about this verse, though, he says salvation is far from the wicked. Let me define this word: deliverance, helping, saving health. Welfare. It's a bigger, a big picture. Now, he's not just talking about physical things. He's talking spiritually. And do you know what the word here for salvation is? Anybody? Salvation is found in no other name. The word translates from Hebrew, Yeshua. That's so powerful. Salvation isn't just a thing. It's a person who does the saving. Jesus is, the, the way we describe his, his, him in, in the Bible, that means salvation. That means rescuing. That means delivering. And so, people who are not saved are not experiencing this in any way. And that's just reality. And before we knew Jesus, we have to realize we're not having this happen in our life spiritually in any way. We might say, I want that, but until we are saved until we are delivered, helped, saving health and welfare, like all of that together, like Jesus does that spiritually for us. But make it very, very clear that these are our works do not save us because he says, for they do not seek out your decree. So you think like, okay, so they got to do something. Well, no, we'll make that very clear. Look at Matthew 7. He says, this is Jesus talking, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them heard this analogy, and I've heard it in different ways before, but imagine that you had a full glass of water, okay, and you're walking around with it, and somebody else has a full glass of water or whatever they want, and you bump into each other. What's going to happen? It's gonna, something's going to spill out. So the simple analogy is <laughs> what you are full of comes out. And some of us are full of other things that aren't good. I wasn't going to say it. Think about that, though. That, that's what Jesus is saying. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. So what you're filled up with, that's going to come out. And sometimes it doesn't come out in the nicest ways. But sometimes it's just the everyday life. Bump into somebody, and whatever's going on will, will come out in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter. They don't have to vocalize it all the same. Because like, right, we do this all the time. Hey, how are you doing? Does anyone ever stop you and say, do you really want to know? Because I want to tell you. But sometimes it comes out in other ways. We're bottling something up. And someone, someone bumps into us, maybe not physically in life, and, and, and it comes out in another way, in unhealthy ways, because we're full of something that isn't healthy. It isn't good. So we might need some saving. But there's hope if what's coming out of us doesn't look like Jesus. Next part of this psalm says this, Your compassion, Lord, is great. Preserve my life according to your laws, right? It's that word again, preserve, recover, repair, restore. What does this word imply? My lovely and beautiful wife made this amazing discovery on Wednesday. She's like, what? If something needs to be recovered, it means this. It's lost. If something needs to be repaired, it's broken. If something needs to be restored, it needs improvement. Right? Like, you don't, you don't say preserve my life. Like I said, it's not getting preserved in a bottle and protected. It's saying I need to be recovered. I need to be repaired. I need to be restored. Therefore, I am lost. I am broken. And I need some improvement. We don't like to say that, right? We don't really want to admit that. We're like, well, I'm okay. I'm not as bad as this person or this person. But the reality is we have to come to that. And he, what does he say? Your compassion, Lord, is great. He's saying the wicked, they're not following you. But your compassion is great for the wicked and for himself. He's saying preserve, 
recover, repair, restore my life according to what? God's laws. That means God's ways. Like, i got to align myself with what God says, not just what I think or what I feel. Like, I have to look at God's word. We're all wicked, lost, broken, and need improvement. Aren't you glad you came to church today to have Pastor Keith tell you that? Because I'm telling myself that, too. But where are we going to find mercy, compassion? What's even more difficult is when people who are guilty, who are breaking God's laws, don't seem to care. Right? Come on, we, we, we have observed somebody else and we're like, I can't believe they don't even care. And, and the, the psalmist echoes similar things. He's been doing it most of Psalm 119. And you're wondering, like, who are these people? But he says, many are the foes who persecute me, but I have not turned from your statutes. You know this word persecute, right? We, we often think on, on an extreme level, right? We think maybe another country where someone's getting hunted down, and that, that's real. But persecution in its, in its like rawest form means some, something is chasing you down. Something's nagging at you. And it's, they're trying to get at you, trying to get your attention. And oftentimes, people, this many, are people who are persecuting it, like a, a believer is somebody who's, they're not even targeting you, but they're parading their lifestyle and their sin in front of you. Like, oh, I don't, I don't care. I don't feel guilty. I just do this stuff, and I don't care what God's word says or anything like that. And they might, even, might not even vocalize that just by their lifestyle. And that could make us feel like, oh, man, they're, they're chasing me down. They're trying to get me to... to to live this way or be pulled into that. That's what persecution means, chasing, pursuing. But it's so interesting now, right? We might say, oh, that, that stuff's chasing me down. But think about the world right now. What do you do on social media when you're interested in something? You follow them. So now the enemy has, has played the game differently. He doesn't even need to chase us down with it. He gets us to follow them. Think about your own life right now. How many people do you follow on social media, read books, articles, blogs, that are an absolute rejection of Jesus, his ways, and his words? And you have to answer that. And again, if you don't know the difference, and you can't identify that, then that's a warning sign. Well, well then who are you listening to? You're like, now it's like, oh, they're not even persecuting you. You're following them, saying, oh, I want to know their insight about life. And it might start in something neutral. Like, oh, I want to know what they think about fashion. I want to know what they think about, you know, this item or this thing. And then suddenly you find out there's other things being thrown in there. And, the, and you suddenly, here's what the psalmist is even admitting. You start to feel the pull, the tug to live a different way, to think a different way. And you think the enemy is going to come out and say, by the way, this is bad. Don't read this. Don't watch this video. Don't listen to this speaker. Don't read that book. No, it's going to be packaged to look good. He goes on, he adds to this verse. He says, many of the foes who persecute me, but I've not turned from your statutes. I look on the faithless with loathing. Again, that sounds like bad, but we're going to define it. For they do not obey your word. The word loathing means this. He's grieved. And I think he's grieved on, a, on multiple levels. One, the real heart of God is you're broken for people who are not following Jesus, that are living in a way that you know is just destructive for their life in so many ways, and it actually hurts. You're like, I don't want to see them do that. But the other grieving and the loathing here, I think, too, is, is a personal one. That's why he says, I have not turned from your statutes. Why would he say that unless he was feeling a tug, a pull? And we've all been there, let's be honest. Sometimes... People who are not living for the Lord, their life looks fun. It looks good. It looks exciting. It looks better. It looks lasting. It looks fulfilling. It looks satisfying. And it might be for a moment, but it's not going to last. And we get pulled by those things. And we say, oh, it's not even that bad. It's not, it's not, it's not bad. And then we start to feel that pull. We're not satisfied anymore with what we have. We want what somebody else has. Forget social media. Just drive down your street. Look at somebody else's house. Look at somebody else's car. Look at somebody else's whatever. And be like, that, that, I, I'm, mm, I, that, that, I, I, wanted, I want to know what they know because my life would be better if I had that. Really? Are you sure? That sounds like 
Something's chasing you down. Something's pursuing you in a subtle way, but it's starting to pull at our heart and our contentment. Ecclesiastes, a book of wisdom, says this. I've been listening to a great sermon series on this, but uh, it uses this word, right? If you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, I always say, don't read it on a cloudy day. (laughs) It could bring you down, but there's some real good truth in there. And, And the writer of Ecclesiastes, whether it's Solomon or not, It says this. He says, a bunch of things are meaningless. And here's the list, the short list. (laughs) Wisdom and folly, right? Both sides, meaningless. Pleasure, meaningless. Toil, that means work, meaningless. Advancement, meaningless. Riches, meaningless. And he actually starts out the book by saying, everything is meaningless. What are you saying, Pastor Keith? I'm going to say, read that to the end of the book. He has a conclusion. He says, This is the conclusion. And just a side note, uh, you can hear it here first. When when, when Trump has a band, that's an awesome band name. The conclusion. And here's the scripture we're going to use. You heard it, Anthony. Your hair has to come back for that. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Whoa! This is Solomon. He he, Potentially, he has wisdom, and he had everything. And the book of Ecclesiastes is saying, it doesn't fulfill. I, I tried it all, everything, and it doesn't work. And he concludes that book by saying, here's the conclusion. Fear God. And do what he says. Whoa, that's huge. That's big. That's heavy. Here's the question. Is it true? Are we going to trust the Bible and this biblical writer? That is that accurate? Well, I'm going to find out for myself. Okay. You might end up on that same road really quick. And some of us have. We've, we, we've, we've been tempted. We've been pulled. Thomas is saying, God, I'm trying to stay true to your word. I'm not going to get pulled in all those other directions. Notice it says, when when it all has been heard, when it's all said and done, my encouragement to you this morning, do not wait until it's all said and done. Don't wait for that last moment to figure this out and on on your deathbed say, you know what? Yeah, I really should have been living differently. Wow, that would be a tragedy. Come to face with reality now. That without Jesus, we're lost, we're broken, and we need improvement. But there's only one Yeshua that can do it. There's only one salvation. Amen? Well, that should get a little more excitement from the church. Here's what Acts 4.12 says. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved, rescued, drawn out of that, that, that pit, drawn out of that drowning in our own sin, And until we say, hey, I need some help, we're going to stay there. And we think, like, I got this. I can do this. Right? You ever have a treading contest with my wife? You will lose. Okay? She can tread forever. You know what treading is? All right? You have to get deep enough in the water where your feet don't touch. Okay? And, like, and then just stay afloat. You know? You ever done that? Try it. Next time you're in the water... You know, like, Pastor Keith, we don't want to go that deep lately this year on Long Island. Okay, well, wait till you're in someone's pool, right? It sounds good at first. You're like, oh, this is fun. It's a workout. No noodle, no raft, no swimmies. Like, within a few minutes, you will find out how exhausting that is. And if you do it for any amount of time, you get out of the water and you stop, your body is literally like, oh, <laughs> And I want you to just have that mental picture of spiritually, sometimes we do the same thing. Like, why aren't things working? I feel like I'm treading all the time, and there's nothing to grab on to. Salvation's found in no one else but Jesus. He wraps up this portion of Psalm 19 by saying this, See how I love your precepts. There's that word again. Preserve my life. Repair, recover, restore my life, Lord, in accordance with 
Do you realize that God does that because he loves us? He, he wants to do this. And he says, all your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. It's similar to our end last week. God's word is reliable and made to last. Isn't that good to know? Like, we're not going to ever exhaust his truth and say, all right, I read the Bible, I figured everything out, I'm done. Like, really? Well, come talk to me, because I want to know what you figured out and that you're done, because it's inexhaustible, but it's reliable, and it's going to last. And it has this long. I mean, we keep forgetting, I think, sometimes, but, like, this is thousands of years later, and here we are still talking about some of these truths that are just as relevant as they were then. And so I want you to know as we wrap up this morning that God loves to restore. He loves to repair. And he loves to recover. So you have to kind of figure out, you might say, all three. (laughs) I I need all three. There might be an area that you feel like you're honing in on. Maybe the Holy Spirit's honing in on in your heart and your life. And I want you to respond to that. I want you to respond to God because he can do it. All you have to do is say, I want in. Help me. Start that process, whatever it looks like. And realize, right, Tim knows, restoration takes a little bit of time, whether it's personally, whether it's a van, okay? It doesn't happen overnight. And, and some of the early stages is what? Ripping out all of the junk. And we're like, oh, that's going to be painful. That's going to hurt. Yep. But God's going to replace it. He's going to restore it. He's going to, he's going to put something in there, and he's going to upgrade it, and he's going to make it better. Amen? Some of us know this, and some of us are in the midst of that process. Trust him. He's going to do it. Here's the thing. He's the only one who can. And maybe we've tried, right? Come on. We've all bought a book. We've all, someone said, try this, you know? How to create a habit. And I'm not saying those things are wrong, but without coupled with God's truth and and God's word, you are wasting your time. I don't care what you've tried to accomplish in your life. If if it's not coupled with the power of the Holy Spirit to empower you, then you're going to just be sitting there forever trying in your own strength. I thought about this, right? There are so many things out there, and they're, they're, they're not all bad, but oftentimes they go back to you. You have to muster up enough strength. But very few things say there's an outside source that's unlimited and available at all times that can help you and will actually steer you in the right direction. You'd be like, oh, sign me up. What is that? His name is Jesus. (laughs) He's the only one who can do that. And and it's about literally having and forming a relationship with him. And that's going to, that scares people. It should make us encouraged, but like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Start somewhere. What do you do when you have a relationship with somebody? You talk to them. At least you should. (laughs) Otherwise, your relationship won't last long. All right? And all the wives said amen. Just kidding. Right? Sometimes it's the other way around. But think about that. Relationship is about communication. Praying isn't just something we do because we have to. It's an opportunity to commune and talk to God. Now you say, well, I, I, I never heard God speak. I have never heard God's audible voice either. But God has sure spoken to me. The first thing right here is God's word. God's word is, describes itself like this, that it's living and active. Okay? Name any other New York Times bestseller that makes that claim. Okay? No, no, no one can. It's living and active. I can't tell you how that works. You're not going to find veins in this book and know that it's living. It's not that type of living. It's spiritually living. That You can open it up. The words on the page don't change, but depending on your relationship with the Lord, you go deeper sometimes and understand and go, wow, I never saw that before. That can happen in simple things where we look at something from new lenses, a new perspective, and we see something go, oh, wow, that's just in the regular world, but how much more spiritually? That's the number one way God wants to speak. And sometimes we don't even bother to pick it up. And then we say, God, I'm praying. You're not answering. And then he says, are you reading my word? Oh. (laughs) It's basically like putting a muzzle on God's mouth and saying, I want to talk to you, but I don't want you to respond. He will in other ways. 
He's good at that nudge on the inside when you know it's him and it's not heartburn. (laughs) He can do that. He will sometimes use other people, sometimes in sources that we don't like. I will raise my hand first. People have said things to me. I didn't like how they said it. I didn't like the delivery, but it was true. And man, that humble pie never tastes good, but you know you needed to hear it. God will sometimes use people like that. I want you to know this morning that God can do it. He can recover. He can repair and restore. And remember that last part of the story that means needs improvement will probably be in that process our whole life. Constantly needing improvement. Upgrades, tweaks, little things that God and only God can do. I want to pray for you this morning. Encourage you to stop by Connect Center. That's our kitchen, but that's also a space where we want to connect with you. If this is your first time here, please stop by. Have another bagel. Have another cup of coffee. Find out what's going on here. We want you to connect more importantly with Jesus than anything else. But we're a church that believes in fellowship, hanging out together, being a family. And so we would love for you to be a part of that if you are looking for that. So I want to encourage you this morning as we close, and then I'll give that update on tour and pray for him. Lord, we thank you that your word speaks loudly and clearly. We're reminded today by this portion in Psalm 119 is that because of your love, you pursue us with compassion and mercy. You're not out to get us. You're out to rescue us. You know we're drowning, and sometimes all we need to do is admit that. So God, I pray for everybody that was real in the last few moments and cried out to you, God, I know, I know that you're going to meet them in a real and tangible way. And so God, I pray that as they journey through what that looks like in their own life, that this church will come alongside of them and help them to understand who you are and how to live out what you are trying to do in each and every part of life, that you'll continue to recover, restore, and repair. And God, we're so grateful that we even have the opportunity that you do that, God. And then what the most amazing thing is, God, then you, you show us all because it's your work in our life. And then we can say, look what the Lord has done. So God, I'm so grateful for this time together that we read your word, we responded, we we worshiped you through song, God. And so just continue this conversation throughout our week, God. Help us to develop that relationship with you, that communication. Help us to open up our word. Maybe we need to blow off the dust. Let us not live in a place of feeling guilty or bad, God, you welcome us back and say, let's get right back into where we left off. So God, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen.